African island of Madagascar is one of our planet's great miracles. For most places, it's very hard to summarize a country in one word. But Madagascar makes it very easy. Unique covers all aspects of this wonderful nation. A lot of it has to do with its isolated location, which can be linked to its atypical geological formation. So, to start, we'll travel back through time to look at Madagascar's geological history. Now, until the Jurassic period, which is around 185 million years ago, that's when the first dinosaurs walked the Earth, it was part of the supercontinent Gondwana. Now, this supercontinent formed around 400 million years ago, during an event that we refer to as the Pan-African Orogeny. Now, gemologists with an affinity for geology are familiar with this event, since it's responsible for many of the major gemstone deposits around the Indian Ocean, including the Tanzanites in Tanzania, rubies in Mozambique, savorites in Kenya, sapphires in Sri Lanka, and many, many more. Obviously, the traces of this incredible geological event can also be found in the gem deposits and geology of Madagascar. While some of its geological roots are shared with its current geographical neighbors, the island of Madagascar has quite literally followed its own path. After the breakup of Gondwana into a western part and an eastern part, that eastern part broke up even further. Around 125 million years ago, it broke into two parts. One part comprising India and Madagascar versus parts of Australia and Antarctica. Now around 88 million years ago, India broke off from Madagascar, and India started drifting northwards towards Asia, and when it hit Asia, it formed the Himalaya Mountains. But that means that Madagascar has been isolated for a long time. While some of Madagascar's older rocks share an origin with those in the places that are now far removed, like Sri Lanka, southern India, southern Tanzania, Antarctica, parts of Australia, that doesn't mean that Madagascar's geological evolution stopped there. Since its isolation, sedimentary layers have been deposited along its coasts, and volcanic activity has left its mark on many parts of the island. But we'll talk more about that later, because it's very important for certain gemstone deposits. For almost a century, Madagascar has been known for its fine pegmatite-related mineral specimens, with a heavy focus on quartzes, barrels, and tourmalines, like we can see here. Only in the last 30 years or so, has Madagascar really become a powerhouse in the more traditional gem scene, with the discoveries of sapphire deposits in the southern provinces of the islands. Now, this doesn't mean that the precious blue corundum variety is all that matters. The sapphire fields produce many other gem varieties like garnets, chrysoberyls, including alexandrite and cat's eyes, zircons, and many, many more. More gem and mineral discoveries happened all over the island, from fancy sapphires at the far northern tip of the islands to the Grand Diderite mines in the deep south. The traditional pegmatite regions haven't been ignored either, with many rare minerals and gems continued to be mined and discovered, including rarities such as pezodite, londonite, lidocotite, and many, many more. To get a better understanding of some gem deposits in Madagascar, a team of GIA field gemologists traveled to the northwestern part of the island. Now, this is a lesser known region by gem and mineral aficionados who tend to focus more on the sapphire gravels around Ilakaka or the pegmatite districts around Ansira Bay and Tulinar in the south. Previously, we mentioned that a lot of Malagasy geology is linked to the East African orogeny and the Mozambique belt. But that is not really the case for the specific region we discuss here. The entire western part of Madagascar consists of sedimentary sequences, like layers of clay, limestones and sand, that were deposited along the coast of the sea created by the opening of the Mozambique Channel. In the north of the country, a lot of volcanic activity has also occurred. These ancient eruptions created the fertile land that makes this land so rich, but they also altered these young sedimentary rocks, occasionally leading to wonderful exotic mineralizations resulting in gemstones. Deep in one of the mangrove swamps, right at the limit of the tide line, there's a gem deposit that was formed by a unique combination of geological features. 
Now, in 2008, 2009, locals discovered some bright green crystals in the tidal forest near the village of Ante de Zambato. These gemstones formed in a geological environment that geologists refer to as a scarn deposit. So a scarn occurs when a magmatic rock, in this case it's a lamprophyre, intrudes into a sedimentary sequence, so a layer of sedimentary rocks. Now this sudden influx of heat because of that intrusion, but also new fluids and chemicals, destabilizes the system and creates a whole new environment for mineral formation. Fluid starts moving through the rocks where there's least resistance. Typically, that's along fractures. Fractures that could have been there or were newly created by the intrusion. Or sedimentary layers with a higher permeability, mostly with sandy layers rather than clay layers. Now, this fluid carries a lot of extra building blocks for new minerals to combine with the elements that it leaches from some of the sediments. And all of a sudden, you have a situation where all the ingredients and conditions are present for a new material to form. Now, this new material precipitates in pockets alongside many other crystals, including quartz and calcite. This is what we're after. Here we see like these little clusters of garnets, bright green standing out against the matrix, and these are the dementoids. So here we can see what the importance of these pockets is what the importance of the fluids here is in formation of these demantoid garnets. Now, once these crystals were identified as demantoid, it sparked a mining rush for the verdant crystals. Like most of the gemstone rushes, this one only lasted for a short while. Hindered by the remote locality, tidal flooding twice a day, and lack of high-grade tools, many miners abandoned the site after a few months. So the following years, after 2010, saw very little mining action. It was just limited to a few local villagers digging around for some of the crystals they could find on the surface. Now this changed in 2018, when a company called Prosperity Earth partnered with the claim owner to develop the deposit at a larger scale. They brought in extra capital, heavy equipment, experienced personnel, all to maximize the gem production of the deposit. Combining the hands-on knowledge of the local villagers with the experience of the trained geologists and equipment operators, they started planning the mine and extracting the mantoids. Now the tropical climate helps some of the mine. Since many of the rocks are partially weathered, it makes the use of explosive redundant. Heavy equipment is still used to break down the waste rock and remove it, but you only need jackhammers for it. The miners follow the trends in rock to find pockets that hold the green treasure, and well-crystallized calcite suggests the presence of a nearby pocket and alerts miners to switch to lower impact tools, like hand tools, until they break into the pockets and can scoop out all the material. The pockets themselves are often lined with intricately formed calcite crystals, some quartz crystals, and well-crystallized demantoid garnets. They are completely covered in wet mud, which has to be drained away. Once the contents of the bucket are bagged, they are transported to the wash plant, where they are manually washed on a screen to remove the finer waste material, but that immediately reveals the presence of the bright, sparkly demantoids. So they can be hand-picked out of that concentrate, and nice crystal specimens can be removed as well. So while the climate does play a role in making the mining a bit easier because it naturally eroded and weathered some of the rocks, the location brings a set of challenges that require significant planning and understanding of the local environment. Road access to the site is limited and requires at least an hour of road tracks, triple that when it rains, to reach the main roads. From there, it is another hour to the larger town of Ambanza. Under ideal conditions, it still takes you more than 20 hours with a 4x4 truck to reach the capital of Antanarivo over 30 hours if you take any other mode of transport. The mine is also accessible by boat, but it requires a skilled navigator to maneuver the muddy maze of mangrove swamps, and even then, this can only be done during the high tide. The tides also impact the actual mining site, since it floods during high tide. A series of dams and barriers is built to keep the seawater out when the tide rises. Much of the original mangrove forest was cut down or damaged during the initial mining rush, around 2009-2010. Prosperity Earth, the company that works it nowadays, has made efforts to replant some of it. 
The company also prides itself on its commitment to Madagascar. And while the owners are American, the workforce is entirely Malagasy. They are aiming to keep as much value as possible in country. And they set up a cutting factory in their office in the capital city, where they have a team of local lapidaries faceting a large part of the production in terms of value. This means the bigger stones. Now, northern Madagascar soil is extremely rich and the area sees a lot of rainfall. So this leads to abundant jungle cover and great conditions to grow tropical crops. Now the local geology is the cause of the richness of these soils since it has been significantly altered by volcanic intrusions that have weathered to the very rich, dark red soils that we see in a lot of tropical places. Now these rocks include several basalts. Now basalt rocks are sometimes associated with groups of fancy sapphires. This group of sapphires is often referred to as the BGY suite, blue, green, yellow, due to the typical color variations that are found in these sapphires. The colors of these sapphires are often pretty dark and the stones are often characterized by high iron contents. Diego Suarez is the trade name given to the entire sapphire producing area in northern Madagascar. The name is given after the old name of the city of Ansiranana. In reality, the sapphire fields can be found across the entire province of Diana and the northern parts of the Sawa province. Now, several of these areas are off limits due to safety concerns, but GIA was able to visit a recently discovered sapphire prospect near the village of Ambo di Finesi. This town is located about three hours drive from the town of Ambanza on dirt roads, through scenic landscape and past small jungle villages consisting of wooden houses in the middle of their tropical fields. Now, the precious stones were found by farmers who were working on the hill flanks to culture pepper, vanilla, cocoa and coffee. The area shows many signs of the traditional slash and burn practice, locally referred to as Tavi. After the harvest, farmers burn the fields and forests to create new fertile ground using the ashes to replenish nutrients in the soil. However, if done on a large scale, this leads to massive ecological degradation over a longer term. The mining, on the other hand, is extremely localized and small-scale. The mining crews get permission from the landowners to sink shafts into the ground. The earth they dig up is brought to the river where it is washed by hand to retrieve the sapphire. All of the work is done with simple hand tools. The area is simply too remote to bring in heavy equipment. Now it's noteworthy that most of the miners are not from northern Madagascar. Upon hearing from these finds from cousins, relatives, business connections, they temporarily moved from the southern provinces, where sapphire mining is much more common, but competition is also a lot higher. These miners built a makeshift village out of bamboo huts, and even the lady who sets up the local shop and bakery is part of the traveling mining crew from southern Madagascar. Our GI was able to chat with the miners and purchase some samples directly from them, and these samples will be used by GI researchers to study in their laboratories around the world to assist in our origin determination work. Madagascar is truly one of the richest countries when it comes to gem reserves. An incredible variety of precious stones has been discovered in astonishing volumes. This visit by GI field gemologist highlights that even in lesser known areas of the countries, some fantastic treasures can be found. The gem industry in Madagascar is a young one, with only a few decades of experience. Combining this with a turbulent political history, a secure and efficient framework for the gem industry is mostly lacking. Export procedures have been randomly suspended and are prone to change very suddenly. Obtaining mining licenses is complicated and the fragile supply chains as well as financial system make investing and maintaining operations very challenging. Nevertheless, there is much goodwill in the country to develop the gem scene sustainably, but there are still several hurdles to be taken. Regardless of that, Madagascar is a true El Dorado for any gem and mineral enthusiast. We are always warmly welcomed by the Malagasy people, and Madagascar will remain an extremely important country for the gem and mineral industry over the next decades to come.